at Nike for about 10 years, and I got to work on some super awesome businesses, the early days of LeBron James and uh, Nike's custom shoe business, which does about a million and a half pairs of custom shoes um, shipped all over into uh, 28 countries every year. And then finally, uh, um, Nike's digital sport business. And Nike is a really awesome place. Um, and they've had amazing results. Uh, if you look at, this is just the last uh, 20 years of Nike's global revenues, from four billion to now I think they'll hit 30 billion this year. You know, it's not very often you've got a brand um, that's resonant to your parents, uh, cool to you, and will be cool to your kids. Rock bands don't last that long. Clothing companies don't, but Nike has had this incredible uh, long run, and it doesn't look like they're going to slow down anytime soon. And people always ask me, um, what's the secret to Nike? How have they made this work and had such market leadership for such a long period of time? And the answer is actually always really quite simple, and that is to focus on the voice of the athlete. Okay? So this is actually a shot of Eric Avar, who's uh, one of Nike's best and most seasoned designers having a conversation with Kobe Bryant uh, a couple years ago. And, and at Nike, you spend an inordinate amount of time with the athlete, understanding who they are and how they play their sport. And then you build that product around their, their needs. And based off of this conversation, and um, inspiration actually from cable tie bridges, which are uh, gorgeous, uh, very minimal use of material, very, very strong, actually led to this shoe which is a shoe called the Nike Hyperdunk, uh, which turned around the basketball business at the Beijing Olympics back in 2008. But this mantra, this idea of always listening to the voice of the athlete was something that Phil Knight would say all the time. As a matter of fact, inside the tongue of a few of uh, LeBron's shoes, it actually says, never forget to hear the voice of the athlete. And this is both a way to approach product creation, but also is a way to approach how do you attack the market. Because if you think about sports, right, uh, sports and business have a lot in common. They're both competitions. They're both about winning. They're both about strategy. They're both about um, quickness. And listening to the way that athletes approach dominating in their sport is what has inspired Nike's approach to dominating in business. Okay? And that's especially true of this idea that always came from Phil Knight. That's a great shot of Phil running many years ago. Uh, always listen to the voice of the athlete. So this is especially true of Nike's first signature athlete. And long before there was Michael and Bo, and that's Johnny McEnroe up there on the left, and Ken Griffey Jr. and Charles Barkley, there was this guy. You're like, who the heck, was that the janitor? No, that's Steve Prefontaine. He was Nike's first signature athlete. And I want to take a second to tell you a little bit about him. Steve was a scrawny kid from a, uh, from a logger, a small logger town in the Oregon coast called Coos Bay, Oregon. Um, Steve uh, was too, was, you know, in, in Coos Bay, you were either into logging or into sports, and Steve was into sports, and he wanted to play football, but the coaches told him he was too small for contact sports, which in his words said left him smoldering. So Steve turned to running, and he ran faster and harder and trained more intensely than anyone that they ever seen in the history of that small yet very celebrated school program. Pre ended up at the University of Oregon under the tutelage of Bill Bowerman, who ended up uh, co-founding Nike with Phil Knight. And he, Bill Bowerman was a world-class track and field coach. And he brought Steve under his wing. And what happened at the University of Oregon during that sort of renaissance for track um, was amazing. Steve was not a gifted runner in the way that you think about like a savant with these long legs sort of running like a deer kind of. He was not, he was crouched and intense and he ran harder. When you saw him run, what you saw was pain. And runners take a lot of pride in this. Um, runners will say to other athletes at the school, hey, my sport is your sport's punishment, right? And that's really, uh, that's running and that was pre. Nobody pushed themselves harder. Nobody was able to absorb as much pain as Pre did. And if you knew you were going to go out on a training one with Pre, it was going to be the workout of, of your life. And that's who he became. And he started to amass this gigantic following. And he was intensely competitive. Um, uh, he, won, he was like Michael Jordan, who has to win at everything. And 
Pre once famously said, hey, somebody may beat me, but they're going to bleed to do it. That was the spirit of Prefontaine. And he was brash. He was a rebel. Um, track at the time in the late 60s and early 70s was super stuffy, right? Um, and so Pre would call out the establishment. At that time, it was the Amateur Athletics Union. And he said, these guys are exploiting athletes, and they are, uh, you know, they're sort of this pompous organization, and then they're not right for track. At the same time, Pre would call out his competition. Um, you know, in press conferences and in TV interviews, he would say when he's going to race, who's going to be there, and how he's going to beat them. So before there was Floyd Mayweather, <laughs> um, there was Steve Prefontaine. And he started to amass this huge following, and everywhere there were track meets, they would stack the stadium, especially at famed Hayward Field in Eugene, Oregon. And you would see these Go Pre shirts everywhere. Um, there was one race in the 1972 um, uh, U.S. track and field qualifying meets where some of the competing runners actually showed up in shirts that said Stop Pre, okay? And then you started to see some Stop Pre shirts in, in the stands. So the race happens, they step up to the starting line, and um, the, you know, some of these other runners had warmed up in shirts that say Stop Pre. Pre smoked them, okay? ends up winning, going away, runs over to the stands, grabs a Stop Pre shirt, and does a victory lap around all of Hayward Field wearing a shirt that said Stop Pre. That was Pre. That's who he was. Now, at one point, he held every U.S. record, uh, from all, all seven of them from 2,000 to 10,000 meters. He was amazing. And his, reb his rebellious spirit, his grit, um, his everything that he embodied was what Nike wanted to build their company around. And that's why they made him the first signature athlete. And, it, and for the first 30 years of the famed Nike World headquarters, there was one statue. Not a Michael Jordan statue, not a Nolan Ryan statue, none of There was one statue, and that was a statue of Steve Prefontaine. So I hope I've set the table a little bit. But Steve taught Nike something about business. And it's a mantra and an ethos that has stuck with Nike throughout that whole up and to the right chart that I showed you at the start. And that has to do with the idea of the safety of the pack. And very classically runners, and you see this in cycling a lot, they tend to cluster together in races, okay? And there's three reasons. One, you can draft off of the runners in front of you or near you, okay? So you don't have all the wind resistance yourself. Two, you can see them. They're in your periphery. You don't lose what the competition is doing. And three, you can react. So if someone makes a move, you can make a move, okay? You can sort of react off of what that crowd is doing. And, then, and if there's one idea I, that I want you to take away today is that Pre never ran that way. He always had the courage to lead from the front. That's how he went, that's how he approached it. And if you think about that as a business principle, you can say, I'm going to be the next here and be in this pack, and if someone else in my competitive set does this, then I can react to it, but I'm not gonna take all the headwinds and try and get out there myself, that's dangerous. I'm gonna stay with the pack or you can lead from the front. Peter Thiel, famed, uh, one of the original founders of PayPal and famed uh, um, uh, VC and investor said, you don't wanna be the nth person in a category, you wanna be in a category of your own. You want to break away from that pack rather than be stuck with it, okay? I think there are three really interesting examples in the remaining time that I have that I wanna share with you that I think illustrate this point. Uh, one is Nike, so I call it this idea of just a shoe company, okay? So dial it back to 2006. Um, Nike at the time was trying to get out of this sort of endless marketing cycle of where you would run all of this media from TV and web and PR to try and get someone to the store to buy your shoe. And then you'd sort of restart the whole thing the next quarter, okay? And what great brands were starting to evolve to, and, and Nike was really a leader here, and said, wait a minute, when that receipt rolls off the register, that's when the relationship would start, and we can use that moment to sort of give them what they really need, which is training and community and feedback. That's going to drive a connection to those athletes, and then they're going to come back and buy our shoes. I don't have to keep running TV ads, right? You know, and so when you really dug in with runners and truly tried to understand what it is that they needed, beyond cushioning and I overpronate and I need an airbag or something like that, they needed feedback on their progress. They needed expert guidance. They wanted to be motivated. They wanted to not feel lonely when they were out running. 
and they wanted a better sport music experience than they had. And then so Nike took that in and said, well, well, but Nike's just a shoe company. They don't make any of that stuff. And that's where Nike, at a, at a time when Adidas or Under Armour or Puma or any of these other companies that were in their competitive set, they said, you know what, we're going to make a leap forward here. And we're going to invest in a landmark partnership with Apple to build what was then called in 2006 Nike Plus. Remember, it's the little pod that went in the shoe, a one-axis accelerometer that was able to tell you through voice on your original uh, iPod Nano distance, pace, uh, speed. Um, that led to then GPS watches. And then as the mobility industry finally started to evolve, um, award-winning apps on iOS and on Android, they even held something called the human race, which was they had a million people all over the globe digitally running at the same time. A virtual race happening all over the globe. And that led to this idea of, of Nike Plus, which then as the, as the wearable space evolved, led to the launch of a product called the Nike Plus Fuel Band, which I, I had the privilege of working on for about three years of my life. And this created a whole bunch of momentum and Nike was literally reinventing itself and reinventing uh, the relationship with the customer. It was less about marketing to you, more about bringing your data in and building an experience for you that was gonna build that, that loyalty. And then, and then you know what, about five years later, the pack started to sort of get wise to it. Remember how we talked about the pack? Someone leads out and then they started reacting. And so between, under Armour buying Matt My Fitness and Endomato and My Fitness Pal for a total of almost $750 million. And then Adidas going out and buying uh, Runtastic and other acquisitions in that space. A billion dollars was spent to try and catch up. But at that point, Nike had already amassed 60 million members, okay? At a fraction of the cost of what the late adopters, the pack, had to go pay other companies to acquire all of those customers. And it's not just about having the customers, it's about having the brand that came from leading out. So in Fast Company's 2013 50 Most Innovative Companies issue, who was number one? It was Nike. There's the CEO, Mark Parker. There is Serena Williams wearing a fuel band on her wrist, something that she's wearing still this week at the US Open. So how did Nike surge forward? How did they break away from the pack? They had the courage. They, they ran running like pre runs a race. Make sense? Next example, Apple, jump a year forward. Remember the phones at the time? The super sleek Motorola Razor. I know there's a few pink Razor owners out there, former, okay? Or it was, it was the kind of the, the Blackberry, sort of Nokia smartphone space where, uh, like the Palm Trio, where all these companies were sort of like trying to turn your phone into your IBM computer. And if you remember, at the, you should go back and watch it, the 2007 iPhone keynote, it's on YouTube, best watch ever. So interesting the things that Steve Jobs talked about at that moment, but he called out these other competitors. And he said, look, we, we need to get out of this space, okay? This is what the pack is doing. And he even said, I actually freeze framed the slide. He says, we're going to break through. We're going to surge forward. We're gonna get five years ahead of any other phone. And then he launched this. And what's really interesting about the iPhone, which has sort of become the institution, and it's fast followers, sort of the Samsung product, which now account for some like 70% of the smartphone shipments globally, is that when they did this product, they did everything the pack wasn't doing. The, whole, the pack was focused on building a better QWERTY keyboard. Steve eliminated it. The pack was focused on super sleek, clamshell-like Motorola Razor. They didn't even bother. And more interestingly, the entire internet in 2007 ran on Flash. And here was a product that announced that it had the first full functioning mobile, mobile browser that didn't support Flash at all intentionally. So Steve basically said, you know what, we're gonna get in the phone business, but we're not gonna come to the pack. The pack is going to come with us. The question is, what happened to the pack? Okay, these were the titans of the industry then. You probably can't see around the room, but I want you to raise your hand if you ever used a phone made by one of these companies? Pretty much the whole room. Now, now I want you to raise your hand now if you currently are. Okay, I see a couple. Strong titans, I love it. You're holding fast to that Motorola Razor V6. Okay? Yeah, that's right. So, overnight, that this entire industry completely changed. And isn't it interesting that especially in the case of Motorola, who watched their market share shrink 
from 22% in 2006 to four short years later. Again, that's like the difference between one corrupt World Cup to another one, okay? Um, they were gone. I mean, 2000, they got sold to Google for $12.5 billion. And before the paint had even dried in Chicago in the Motorola offices, they got sold again to Lenovo, and now they're pretty much non-existent. They, these were the titans of the cell phone industry. They shipped their first phone in 1983. They had dominated cell phones all through them. I mean, night at the Roxbury, okay, 80s, 90s, into the mid 2000s, it was, it was a Motorola business. And then overnight, someone had the courage to lead from the front, and they were gone. And that is, I think, a really interesting example of having the courage to lead from the front. Don't go do what the pack is doing. You've got to separate yourself. And I think the last really good example is Vivint. Vivint is, a, is a, one of the largest and fastest growing smart home providers in all of North America. And it's founded by this guy, Mr. Todd Peterson. They talked about him earlier with uh, Josh and Jeff, because both of them used to work for Todd. And Todd's really uh, well known of building a high functioning sales organization. But what you may not know about Todd is that as he was building a home services company, he looked at everything inside of the value chain and said, I think I can do this better myself. So I should be doing professional installation, same day, faster and more efficient with better satisfaction than what I'm paying somebody else to do. And then back in those days, you would sell the account or you would, you would install the account and sell it and then you would actually sell it off to a, some huge company like ADT or Monotronics. And Todd said, forget that, I'm going to do it myself. So we built a world-class customer service organization, emergency monitoring stations, and then finally a gigantic field service fleet of now 1,400 that, that um, gets to 96% of zip codes within the U.S. But there was still one thing missing and that was the product. And Todd looked at the product that was in the marketplace then, which was this. This was the Honeywell panel they were installing back in like 2008, 2009. The thing was like, it was conceived and designed when most of you were conceived and designed. Okay? It was on like a 15 year product life cycle. Okay? Todd saw this and he, he had a vision and a hunch that this space was going to move into the connected home. Smart lights, smart locks, thermostats, cameras. But this thing was never going to support that stuff. So we went to Honeywell, gigantic company, and said, I need you to make a better panel. And Honeywell told them to stick it. They said, you know what? This is working for us. We've paid for the tooling and the molds and everything. We're just going to keep rocking this thing as long as we can possibly milk it for. So Todd wasn't satisfied. He went to his creditors at the time and his board, and he said, I want to do this. And you know what his board told him? Stay back. Don't take the risk. Let's just keep doing what everyone else is doing. If a competitor jumps out, then we'll react. And Todd, being Todd, one of, I think, the great entrepreneurs really in the history of the state uh, and in business overall, Todd reacted and said, I'm going to do this myself. So he built a company called Two Gig, which is short for Two Guys in a Garage, which was what Honeywell said. You said, your two guys in a garage could never build a panel better than ours. And then that eventually rolled into the Vivint Innovation Center. And what that led to, which is up in Lehigh, Utah now, what that led to was this product, the industry-leading a smart home platform that's been sort of recognized nationwide and been a huge catalyst for growth because when you look at Vivint's business now in, a, in an industry that's struggling to not be security 80% of the new customers that Vivint has are signing up for smart home okay the industry average is much lower than that and, and as those customers are coming on the average amount that they're signing up with their dollars voting with their dollars is 63 bucks per month because they're paying for a smart home, whereas the old business is paying 39, the average uh, revenue is, th is $39, because Todd had the courage to lead from the front. So I want to close with that. Um, I think it's a powerful idea, and I hope you can apply it both to your businesses, no matter how mature they are, because I think it's what will set you apart from the pack. Thank you.